A total of 12 astronauts have gone to the moon, rocketed up there by scientists who were fueled by optimism and enthusiasm about exploring the unknown. From up there, from the moon, our planet looked perhaps suddenly a bit small. It also looked like if it, it, if it was just one among many other elements out there, but it still looked very lush and beautiful. In the same period in history, more than 40,000 people by the end of the 1960s had been sent out on psychedelic therapeutic journeys out into uh, exploration of, our, of new layers of our psyche. They were sent out there to explore their own minds, to explore their own mental challenges. The astronauts, they came back to Earth filled with new insights into the fascinating grandeur of the universe. The um, patients also came back to us, so to speak, with insights into the magnificent scale of awake human consciousness and full of new experiences. Um, both patients and therapists and also people who just used the drugs recreationally had a great sense and reported a great sense of importance to some of the understandings achieved under these drugs. One person even felt inspired to start a computer company using fruit as its logo, and another person um, suddenly understood and described the structure of the DNA molecule. For approximately four decades, international space agencies have not sent their astronauts back to the moon. And in the same period, psychiatrists have not sent their patients back out into psychedelic space. So why is that? I mean, for the moon, might make sense. I mean, been there, done that. It might not make sense for people to walk around up there just because we can. It probably is dangerous and also quite expensive to have people walking around up there. Uh, for psychedelic uh, psychotherapy, however, it's a bit more strange because it looked so promising. Why was this field suddenly completely closed down? Why were these tools, for legal reasons, taken away from science and from psychiatry? Um, the answer to that question, like many other sort of uh, answers to odd phenomena, is, is of political character, so I won't go into that in this talk. However, with advanced technologies, space science is now looking into, soon going out into the universe and conquering new domains and seeing new corners, new planets. Similarly, with new technologies, Psychedelic science is also coming back. It has already come back. And one of the reasons is exactly these technologies. We now have brain imaging techniques that we didn't have at hand 40 years ago. We can now look into the brain and try to understand some of the biology behind what these drugs are doing. And that's exactly what I, as a psychiatrist and neuroscientist, I'm lucky to be part of. I work in a group at Imperial College where we do this kind of research. We uh, try to investigate the drugs and we try to investigate their potential uh, benefits and potential in therapy by conducting trials. So now, what am I actually talking about? I mentioned psychedelics. Some of you might know what they are, some might not. Basically, here they are. Does anyone know any of them? Then shout. Yeah. Just, I, I mean, shout what it is. Just shout the name. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, you don't need to tell me about if you are tried them. They're class A drugs in Schedule One, so you don't need to, you know, step forward. But does, can anyone mention one of them? Just shout one of them. What? Mescaline. Okay, that's a complicated. One. Yeah, exactly. So here are the names. So DMT is uh, the active psychedelic uh, component of uh, ayahuasca and Amazonian psychedelic brew. Psilocybin is in magic mushrooms. Mescaline in the peyote cactus. And LSD is a semi-synthetic compound. Uh, synthesized and um, de developed by a famous Swiss uh, chemist during the Second World War, who actually also was the one who synthesized psilocybin in the following decade. But that's another story. What is the definition of a psychedelic? What are these drugs? Basically, they're a little bit hard to coin because they are, they're very peculiar and they're very different from a lot of the psychoactive substances that we know. They also have different harm profiles, often scoring less on harm scales than a lot of substances we know, including the legal ones. Um, they do not cause major 
physiological disturbances and they do not cause uh, addiction. But they do cause more or less characteristic changes to our thoughts, to our perceptions, to uh, our mood, um, in a way that is difficult and impossible simply to experience apart from when we are dreaming, if, if not in this state. The, the psychedelic state is often described uh, as being blissful, sacred, maybe even mystical and spiritual. And therefore it's not surprising that these drugs have been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years, by many, many cultures. Not LSD, obviously, but the other ones. Um, and, um, and they have been used in, in ceremonies, in rituals, often even in religious kind of rituals. And that was exactly what inspired uh, a scientist and now we go back into the good old 60s, 1962, on Good Friday, on that very holy day, a very pioneering experiment was conducted in this beautiful room, the Marsh Chapel at Boston University, where scientists gave psilocybin to theology students on that holy day, and they reported a profound religious experience. And 25 year, uh, years later, when the students, who hopefully were not students at that point, were asked how how was how important was it they they reported that it had been one of the highlights of their spiritual lives this motivated colleagues at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore to take these drugs back into science, into the modern era of science. They got their approvals, they set up the trials, they conducted very stringent, uh, uh, well ca uh, um, carried out trials where they used the drugs in people who had never tried psychedelics before and these people, they suddenly become more open. That could be measured with personality measurements. They suddenly become more open to other values, to other ideas and to other ways of thinking and to other ways of doing things. We have recently seen the same in depressed patients in one of our trials at Imperial. So what is all this about? Um, this is uh, quite dramatic and quite powerful uh, that a, a, a drug experience like that can have long-lasting effects like that. Um, so what is the neuroscience behind it? In, in, sh in brief, we don't know. Um, uh, so maybe I shouldn't stand here, but uh, uh, we, maybe, we, maybe, maybe we should know because we are the one, you know, uh, uh, we are among the ones carrying out imaging uh, of the brain in this field. Um, but we have some ideas from some of the results that we have that tap into some of this. Um, so uh, in order for me to try to explain it, I'll just uh, briefly mention something about the brain's networks. This is obviously not a brain, but a beautiful, colorful, a mathematical model of the brain's functional networks. So in order for the brain meaningfully and efficiently to make sense of the different sensory inputs coming into the brain and in order to solve specific tasks and in order just to daydream and self-reflect, the brain becomes more and more used to engage selective um, brain regions uh, together in these networks and rule out other, net, uh, other brain regions that are not strictly necessary for this process. This becomes more and more refined. It become, the networks become more and more clearly defined from childhood to adulthood, and they become more separated from each other. And this allows for a more streamlined, efficient, sophisticated way of doing things and thinking. If we then give a psychedelic, what then happens? Then the brain suddenly becomes quite chaotic, and the um, regions of the different networks. They are not just communicating within the networks as they are in the normal non-psychedelic state, but they communicate completely across, allowing perhaps for a more unconstrained cognition, a more free thinking, a more flexible, flexible mind. A bit like the childlike state, which is exactly meaningful to compare to here. Not to say that children are like people like this, but the, the, the mind, the, the, the brain, remember that the brain come from a, came from a more chaotic state and went into this more clearly defined network state. Um, and if we take a child into the story here, um, I, I use the Lego uh, movie as an example. So in the Lego movie, uh, the, the child, the son, now to completely spoil it if you haven't seen it, but uh, uh, the child, he is playful. And he is a bit anarchistic, a bit chaotic. He takes um, Lego men from one world, brings them into another. 
doesn't respect the system, maybe doesn't respect the networks. A space Lego man can enter the world of the Wild West and play with cowboys and so on, doesn't matter. However, the father in the Lego man, who also plays with Lego, believe it or not, a lot of people do, it's a great thing to play with, but he does that and, and he is incredibly frustrated by this rebellious son. So he glues Lego bricks back where they belong. He probably would also take a doctor gluing back to hospital if he had a psychedelic lab Lego box set, which doesn't exist. But, um, but, but um, anyway, um, why am I saying this? I'm saying that because if our... This is a bit rigid, that way of thinking, being so constrained by the rules of the boxes of the Lego. And if, if it becomes even more constrained and more rigid, we can maybe even start ruminate. And ruminate is where thought spirals are kind of stuck in, in these negative patterns, and that's a feature of depression. And in depression, some of the, the regions within the networks, they become too attached to, to each other within the different networks, some of the networks at least. And, and that is actually what's happening in depression. So maybe it would make sense to shake the system with a psychedelic and counteract that um, um, tendency. And that's exactly what we have done at Imperial. We have done a first depression trial with a psychedelic in modern time, um, where we, it's just a small feasibility study, a pilot study, um, where we gave psilocybin first in a low test dose and the week after a high dose, one-off high dose session with psilocybin to patients who suffered treatment resistant, moderate to severe depression. And what did we see? We saw that, as I mentioned already, that we saw openness increase, like they saw at Johns Hopkins in the Healthy Volunteers, um, and we saw neuroticism and other personality domain decrease. Uh, and we also saw, more importantly, we saw that the um, depressive symptoms, they decreased very significantly, particularly the first week after the treatment, our main outcome, but also at longer term follow-up after three and six months. Um, and the, the results, the first line of results have been published already this year by my colleague Robin Card Harris. Um, and, and we are now expanding the trial, more patients, uh, adding in placebo, and we are not the only ones uh, doing this kind of work. There are other studies going on also with other psychedelics like ayahuasca, the DMT um, uh, drug, and it's also not only in depression, there are similar interesting, promising, equally promising results coming from trials in other conditions like OCD, anxiety, and also addiction to alcohol, addiction to uh, tobacco as well. So what is going on? How is this possible? I mean, this seems quite odd. I would say that a drug has action that lasts way out of the pharmacological possibility of the drug. The drug is out after a day. There's no drug left in the brain, in the body. So how come these effects are longer lasting? Um, we're trying to understand that. Um, and looking at our data, other uh, groups looking at their data, we seem to get close an understanding that it has to do with the quality of the psychedelic experience. It has to do with how profound, how deep, how significant was the actual experience on the drug in the session. That is the predictor um, of, of um, the, the outcomes on um, symptoms and on personality par parameters. This is kind of a paradigm shift, I would say. It's very different from normal psychiatry, normal mental health, where we prescribe medications daily, months, years, for different conditions. This is more like a drug-induced uh, mind um, expanding experience that facilitates a transition, a transition into something more open, less anxious and le less depressed maybe. Um, my colleague at Johns Hopkins, uh, he has used uh, a nice image of thinking about what might be going on here. He compared it to, could it be like inverse post-traumatic stress? Could it be that I mean, in post-traumatic stress, a very negative traumatic life event can cause long-lasting negative impacts on the brain wiring and, and our, on our psychology and mental health. Maybe a profound and meaningful experience could do the opposite. Uh, but and how is that possible? How is all that possible? We need the drug, obviously, because that's the driver, but we also need a pleasant setting. We need a safe and pleasant setting around. And here we have our amazingly pleasant setting. Uh, <laughs> It is basically, uh, it almost looks like the Marsh Chapel that you saw before. No, uh, so, 
we tried to make it a bit nicer. So we decorate it, as you can see here, <laughs> and we use dim light, we have fresh, fresh flowers, we have a six hour long uh, music list that fits into the uh, psychedelic uh, experience. Um, and we sit there around the, 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 the patients going through the trial um, and we guide them through it. But before that, we screen carefully to rule out psychosis, to rule out uh, uh, significant physical health problems. We prepare people, we take a very careful, very um, detailed personal and psychiatric history, get to know them quite well, and we uh, prepare and, and, and practice relaxation techniques with them that we might uh, need during the session if they become challenging. And then we are there around the person to guide, to help, to check in on them. And then later, when the drug effect has um, left them, uh, the days after, we integrate the experience. That means that we sit and try to make sense together with the patient about what happened, what happened inside during the actual session. Um, if that is not done carefully enough, if these factors are not followed carefully enough, and this has not been the case in modern trials, but it has in a few places been the case back in the days, uh, including here in Denmark, and that's also why I mention it, that if, if you don't do all that sufficiently, you might end up like, and I was going to say, like George Clooney in Gravity, but because of copyright and TED, this is no longer George Clooney from Gravity, it might be George Clooney, but it's not from Gravity, but we can't see um, uh, who, who is flo mm. so, so basically you feel a bit like a balloon that nobody holds on to your umbilical cord um, and you might sort of feel that you drift away at least for, for a while if these uh, um, guidelines are not followed. So we are trying not to repeat uh, mistakes from, from early on. Oh, sorry. Um, so we are trying not to repeat those uh, uh, mistakes. So in, in short, I would say, in conclusion, I would say that, that um, I think that the reintroduction of the psychedelics into therapy, into science, is timely. I think it's a time where so many people suffer mental uh, illness. Um, One-fifth of everyone in lifetime should actually develop depression and a third of those will be treatment resistant. Even more will, will suffer anxiety. Um, so it's significant. It's also a time where very few new compounds come out of pharma, uh, out of the pharmacological industry um, for mental health. Um, it's also a time where there seems to be a prospering interest in digging a bit deeper into the depth of the mind rather than just staying on the bumpy surface, and I think that these drugs have a role here. Um, so, um, when conducted carefully and cautiously, I think, believe and hope that these drugs, the psychedelics, will take science and take psychiatry, not just back to the moon, but maybe all the way to Mars. Thank you. Thank you.